Well, thank you very much. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. I always like to come back to YASA. I've had a lot of involvement with the other sponsoring groups too. When, uh, um, when I first was invited to come, I, I, I told the organizers I'm supposed to be somewhere else, but when Pavel uh, asked me to, to come, I, I said uh, I had to be here, and so um, it, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. Um, I'm gonna be talking to you about systems thinking and some of the major uh, challenges. First of all, I wanna thank the various funding sources uh, that have um, helped me to shape my ideas. The title of my talk, I think, is very timely. It's, I didn't come up with the title, but systems thinking is increasing in influence. It's increasing in ecological systems, in financial systems, in international relations, all of which I'll say a little bit about, in food security, in energy, in water, and many of the other things you've heard about and will hear about uh, further today. In 2008, Bob May and George Sugihara and I wrote a paper which said, we're just ecologists, but when we look at the financial system and how interconnected it is, we think that uh, it's a system which is very ripe for a collapse. And as everybody knows, not because of our paper, I hope, uh, a few months later, that's exactly what happened. Thinking from one discipline can help to understand what's going on in other disciplines. Uh, as a follow-up to that, Andy Lowe and I published two weeks ago uh, a perspective in the proceedings of the National Academy arguing that a systems approach, and particularly an approach that comes from biological systems, can be helpful in thinking about how we ought to be regulating financial systems. And together with Bill Miller and the Santa Fe Institute, we will be running a conference in February um, bringing together financial regulators and complex systems theorists and biologists in order to think about how the ways that evolution has dealt with complex systems and with systemic risk can help in developing a new approach to the regulation of financial systems. About three years ago, a number of the people here gathered at YASA to think about international relations and world politics and how small events could trigger larger, possibly catastrophic changes. We called them femto risks, small risk. That was a term that uh, Joshua Ramo, one of the organizers, came up with. And as a result, we published this paper in Proceedings of the National um, Academy of Sciences. The thinking very much influenced by Bob Jervis's book on systems effects in political and social life, thinking about how political systems required a complex systems perspective. And I can give you other examples. Ben Rommelingham, who was one of the participants in that conference, wrote a book about international aid and a complex systems thinking. Josh Ramo's book came out a year or two before that called The Age of the Unthinkable, in which he talked about the fact that we're no longer in a situation in world politics where we just have large powers controlling everything, we have a lot of distributed power, and that's gonna require a different kind of thinking about collective decision making, et cetera, just in order to deal with those systems. So there are lots of opportunities. Many of these challenges that existed when YASA was first created, uh, but many of them new, where all of you, all of us have much to contribute, and YASA in particular. So. There are many topics I could talk about today, but I want to organize my talk around three grand challenges. These are not really new, but I think their time is now. One of them is what, what makes systems robust or resilient? We have a number of people here from the Stockholm Resilience Center, which has been devoted to this issue. So what makes systems robust to critical transitions? I should also 
point out that that doesn't necessarily mean you want to avoid critical transitions. Often we think about stock market collapses, um, world political collapses, but sometimes one needs a critical transition to get us out of a basin of attraction that we don't want to be in. So again, we want to think about how to make those transformations or how those transformations are made for good or for bad. That's going to require us learning how to scale from the microscopic to the macroscopic and back. And I'll talk more about that. And finally, I think the greatest challenge before us, and you saw there are a lot of talks on this topic coming up at this conference, will be how do we deal with problems of the commons? Problems involving public goods and common pool resources, things we all share, we all have interest in protecting, but perhaps none of us and no one of our nations has sufficient incentive to do on their own. So those are the three challenges I want to focus on today. So let's begin with robustness. The central challenge facing societies is how to achieve a sustainable future. And Naki is going to talk about that in his framing talk. What does sustainability mean? Well, it means a lot of different things to different people. It may mean financial markets and economic security. Certainly means energy and other natural resources. And YASA has been perhaps the lead institution in the world in dealing with energy. It means the maintenance of biological and cultural diversity. And it means the protection of ecosystem services, those services that biological systems provide us and give us extra incentive, therefore, to protect those systems. So from a systems perspective, we have to ask, what sustains these services? What sustains these features? How do we avoid losing them? Well, ecosystems and the biosphere, just like this wonderful video of starlings and one hawk that you perhaps can see there uh, that's driving this motion over Rome, um, give us the sense of what can happen when lots of individual agents interact with each other. These are microscopic interactions producing macroscopic patterns. And anybody who's had any exposure to fluid dynamics, which I did as a graduate student, knows that what one may want to do in those circumstances is to try to understand the macroscopic dynamics with an appropriate statistical mechanics of the large numbers of interacting elements. Not only ecosystems and the biosphere are these complex adaptive systems, a term made up by the late John Holland, that is a system that's made up of a lot of individual agents of different features that interact with each other on some local scale in space and in time, producing patterns at broader scales that feed back to influence individual behaviors. Adaptive doesn't mean the system is adapting, it means the elements within it are adapting, not necessarily for the good of the system, but not just ecosystems in the biosphere, but also the socioeconomic systems with which they are interlinked. Stock markets crash. The collective consequences of individual decisions, systemic risks, runs on banks, runs on stocks that can drive markets down as we saw in 2008. There also may be, and this is a great topic of concern at YASA, critical biosphere <coughs> thresholds. We may be approaching a state shifts in the Earth's biosphere. Tim Lent is one of the authors of this paper, uh, and together with uh, um, John Schellenhuber, wrote this um, paper. This is now almost a decade old, but the issue is still as relevant as it was then. If we're worried about sudden changes, sudden tipping in the Earth's systems, we better, we better be thinking about also sudden changes in our socioeconomic systems that will allow us to deal with these to protect, prevent those. Well, many changes of these kinds have early warning signals. Martin Skepper, who's here with us and you'll hear from later, has been leading a resurgence of interest. This is a paper that I was fortunate enough to be involved with, but Martin was the uh, key organizer on 
What are the ways we can anticipate critical transitions in everything from economic systems to biological systems, including uh, physiological signals of fibrillation, of um, epileptic seizures, of migraines, etc. What are the early warning signals? Well, often they're given by this cartoon. Systems that have an equilibrium, that return to that equilibrium, may lose their, their resilience, may lose the capacity to return. And an early signal of that is what's called critical slowing down. The rate of return to the equilibrium is not as fast as it was uh, before. So you stay away longer, and that means you have increasing variance and increasing autocorrelation in the system and possibly flickering between the state you're in and the state you may end up in. So there's a lot of excitement in trying to determine what systems exhibit these properties. Not all of them do. Alan Hastings and Carl Bodeger and Noam Ross have published a series of papers, for example, discussing situations where these early warning signals don't work. Anybody who's familiar with phase transitions in physics knows that there are multiple different kinds of phase transitions. They don't all have the same signals. So while we develop this exciting and, and uh, uh, area in, that I think has a lot of potential for helping us to deal with critical transitions, while we think not just about early warning signals, but how to design systems with increasing modularity, for example, in order to avoid those transitions, we have to avoid uh, overhyping the situation. Many of you my age and older will remember the excitement about catastrophe theory 50 years ago and how it sowed the seeds of its own destruction because it oversold um, a really, uh, some really deep insights. So I think there's a lot of potential in thinking about critical transitions and early warning signals and uh, as long as we exercise appropriate caution. So having talked about robustness and resilience in critical transitions, I think what the lesson of catastrophe theory tells us is we really have to think more about the mechanisms that underlie those transitions to be sure that the models that we're using to describe the systems are appropriate. And that means learning to scale from the microscopic rules that we understand or hypothesize to the macroscopic patterns in both. Um, if we were dealing with a fluid, either under pressure or with increasing temperature, we would rely on what physics did in developing statistical mechanics and the laws of thermodynamics. Namely, we wouldn't be concerned where, where every molecule was moving. We wouldn't be concerned with where every individual is moving. But we would recognize that the macroscopic patterns that we were interested in, like how do you boil water to make tea, depended upon understanding the collective be behavior of large numbers of these elements. So we would develop an appropriate statistical mechanic. When we think about ecosystems, whether they are forest ecosystems or lakes or marine ecosystems, what we're really interested in is not where every plant is, where every animal is. We're not even necessarily interested in every species. We're interested in some broader features of those systems. The forests of the northeast of the United States lost chestnuts for the most part. But that species was replaced by chestnut oak and other species that picked up the functions. If you cared about the American chestnut, then there was a loss. But in terms of the functioning of the system, there wasn't much change. We have to understand what those macroscopic features are and what supports them. These are the things that sustain ecosystem services. So one approach to this is to develop individual-based models, agent-based models. And there's a lot of that sort of work that goes on here. How do you deal with a school of fish, with a flock of birds, with insects? How do we relate the small scale to the large scale? Well, one of the most successful efforts at that um, which um, people like Dan Botkin pioneered, Hank Schugert, my colleague Steve Pakala at Princeton, have been to develop individual-based models of forest growth, with individual trees shading out other trees and interacting with them and in competing for nutrients. 
in order to produce simulations of the sort that you see on the side that reproduce rather uh, effectively the dynamics of those forests. Now, when I say reproduce, I don't mean they explain where every tree is. Because, as you can see, trees die, they're replaced by other trees. Again, one has to understand at what scale this prediction is robust. Uh, indeed, models of this sort have been integrated now, largely by Pakala and his colleagues, with larger scale general circulation models and the like, in order to produce rather reliable predictors of vegetation and how vegetation will change with climate change. Again, it, this doesn't tell you where every tree is going to be. It doesn't even tell you necessarily where every species is going to be, but it tells you where groups of species that perform certain functionalities are likely to be, where you're going to get tundra, where you're going to get taiga, where you're going to get deserts, etc. And similar approaches can examine collective decision-making, a topic I will come back to at the end in groups of animals and groups of humans. Now, one of the things we're going to have to do if these models are going to be useful is to recognize that building more and more detailed models, which we can do because we have so much more computer power, doesn't necessarily give you a better descriptor. There's a lot of work. Carl Walters, who was at Yasa 40 years ago, together with Don Ludwig, published some influential papers showing what we ought to know intuitively, that the most detailed models are not the best, especially not for management. So we have to understand what, what detail ought to be ignored as we scale up. We have to find reduced dimensional descriptions. Now there are some technical mathematical ways to do it depending on what your mathematical model is. One can derive hydrodynamic limits that give rise, for example, to diffusion approximations. Um, we can advance the subject of moment closure. Again, a technique which allows us to approximate uh, large-scale models and eventually reduce the dimensionality. And there are other approaches to aggregation that go back, for example, to Herbert Simon's work and others uh, in economics on how you reduce a large complex model to something that has more robust qualities more, and where one perhaps has some understanding of why the phenomena that appear do so. So I'll give you one example. I've been interested together with two students, Carla Staver and Sally Archibald. Carla and Sally are now professors at various institutions. We were interested in data of this sort, which describe the distribution of vegetation on the planet. In particular, where savannas are and where forest is. Um, there are limits to predictability. There are regions where we know there should be grassland, and there are. There are regions we know there should be forest, and there are. But there are regions where there appears to be biostability. And, um, and we demonstrated this, and so did Martin Scheffer and his group in the paper with Haroda, demonstrating that there was apparently at least biostability in the sense that particular environments could end up in alternative stable states. So we built a model. I won't don't have time to go into the details of the model, and borrowing a picture from Martin's paper, uh, demonstrated that in an intermediate region, and Buzz Holling, working on the spruce budworm, and uh, demonstrated this in a different sort of model years ago, the system was bistable. It could flip between different stable states, and changes in precipitation regimes could drive, essentially, hysteretic cycles. And this is a general phenomenon and Martin uh, emphasized in his excellent book, Princeton University Press, that these sorts of critical transitions can be seen both in nature and in society. So finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about is how we deal with problems of the commons. So public goods problems are widespread in socioeconomic and biological contexts. Here on the left, you see a classic common situation, um, fishermen, oil drilling, all sharing, and of course many other possible uses, all sharing the same uh, areas. That's a familiar one to you. You may not think about tumor growth as a problem of the commons, but in fact, tumors 
exhibit a breakdown of the commons in which some cells um, grow, proliferate at rates that are ultimately damaging to the host, but there's selection at the, uh, at the individual level for those cells to grow. At the same time, by the way, those cells um, produce cytokines and other compounds that are crucial to the growth of the tumor. So we have a project led by David Dingley, an oncologist, to try to use that to break down the sharing, to break down the public goods aspect of the tumor itself by engineering and helping to proliferate cells that don't produce the cytokines. But that's for another day. In the context of what we're interested in here, the classic example, almost two centuries old, William Forster Lloyd talked about, the, he didn't actually talk about the tragedy of the commons, but he did talk about the commons and the problems associated with it where we all share a common ground. It was Garrett Hardin in the 1950s who called this the tragedy of the commons, and his solution was mutual coercion mutually agreed upon, but that largely meant through government action. But Lynn Ostrom, um, who sadly passed away a, a few years ago, demonstrated that this sort of mutual coercion could come from the bottom up, could come about agreements in small fishing communities, for example, as individuals develop norms, uh, norms like fairness with Maya Schluter and Alessandro Tavoni. I've been working on models that try to implement some of Lynn's ideas to how ostracism and social norms can help fishing communities and communities withdrawing water from common grounds to find common purpose so that they don't uh, overuse the resource. This works well in smaller communities. The issue is how can we scale this up to the broader scale? And I'll, in my last few slides, I'll give some ideas about that. The lessons we learned from this are that these are coordination games. Whenever one talks about cooperation, too often one hears discussion of prisoner's dilemma, uh, one of the classic examples that John Nash put forward. Uh, the prisoner's dilemma is a situation that involves only one equal, stable equilibrium. Um, the equilibrium that one would prefer is not an attainable one. Uh, it's not a Nash equilibrium. But the games we're dealing with here are often what are called coordination games. That means if we could just get the number of cooperators above a certain threshold level, we could flip the system from an undesirable equilibrium to a sustainable, desirable equilibrium. So it's a very different uh, kind, of, kind of game. And uh, um, Scott Barrett at Columbia and Astrid Donneberg have been exploring the interplay between these two different kinds of games. So achieving cooperation may depend upon getting above a certain threshold number of cooperators. The modular structure, like Lynn Ostrom talked about, uh, beginning from small groups, can provide the building blocks for broader agreements, especially at the international level. With Avinash Tixit, I've been trying to understand this and how the modular structure, and I won't talk about these models here, but how the modular structure can contribute to achieving cooperation, particularly where pro-sociality is likely to be important at local scales. Lynn Ostrom, in some of her last papers, talked about the need for what she called polycentric approaches, which built upon these sorts of structure in dealing with climate change. And more recently, Bill Nordhaus talked about climate clubs, more or less the same idea. Small numbers of countries reaching agreements that then create building blocks uh, for broader agreements. So with Phil Hannum, Vitor Vasconcelos, and George Pacheco, I've been developing, and that really means they've been developing, models that uh, try to utilize this structure. The idea is one has nations that join together in clubs. Yasa is one such club. Nations could belong to multiple clubs. Individuals within the clubs can then decide whether uh, to make agreements, for example, to restrict emissions. So we have three levels. We have individuals who are not in clubs, we have individuals in the clubs, and then we have individuals in the clubs that, um, um, that take that extra step, that pay that extra price, with a graded reward structure depending on how involved nations are. And we, can, we demonstrate that this, oh, <laughs> sorry, this, somehow this embedded figure is upside down, so just, 
Uh, imagine it's uh, flipped over. I don't know how that happened. Uh, so uh, this incre incre increases, not decreases, is here, the collective public good. So the summary so far is that collective action can be effective if it includes enforcement, uh, that prosociality is an important co contributor to maintaining public goods. And the last thing I want to ask is how are collective decisions made? Um, well, there are various approaches to this. Don sari has been a leader in voting theory, um, an idea that goes back at least to um, Ken Arrow's work. Uh, but also many of these sorts of decisions involve uh, bottom-up collective decision making. Um, and a variety of studies show that theoretically and empirically, collective decision making depends on only a few individuals who have strong opinions and the great mass of individuals who are looking to others for their ideas. And that is crucial to the development of consensus. Without a large number of these uncommitted individuals, what may happen is that the group splits apart, that consensus is not possible. So attitudinal shifts affect actions on issues like climate change. Um, there are maybe few leaders and many followers. Sudden shifts in attitudes that it's given a lot of moments, as we see um, in, in the examples like gender equality, racial equality, cigarette smoking in public, et cetera. And if we're going to succeed in environmental action, we have to understand the importance of these undecided individuals and the potential for sudden shifts. So let me conclude then. Ecological systems and socioeconomic systems alike are complex adaptive systems. And I've discussed many of the features of that. That means that there are a number of challenges that I think face us this week and in the years to come. We need to develop the statistical mechanics of ecological communities, of socioeconomic systems, of the biosphere. We need to model the emergence of ecological patterns and of pattern in these broader systems. Uh, we need, as Martin Skeffer has been doing, to develop indicators of, of impending critical transitions. And most challenging, perhaps, is we need to find pathways to governance in these multi-scale commons. And we're better to do this than in Yasa. Thank you very much.